Good afternoon and welcome to the Federal Railroad Administration's Fiscal Year 2021 Federal State Partnership for State of Good Repair Grant Program webinar. All right, so our presenters today, and each of them are going to say hi after I've, I've called their name. Um, we have Brian Rada, who is the Lead Community Planner, Planner Passenger Rail Policy and Oversight Division. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Looking forward to uh, the presentation today. Thanks, Brian. We also have Matthew Laura, the Supervisory Grants Management Specialist for the Grants and Program Management Division. Hi, all. Uh, looking forward to the presentation as well. I'm glad y'all can be here. Next, we have Judah Lineman, who is the Transportation Analyst for the Freight Rail Policy Division. Hello, everyone. Looking forward to speaking to you. And then we have Laura Schick, who is the Supervisory Environmental Protection Specialist for the Environment and Project Engineering Division. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm glad we can reach so many folks with this format. Thanks for being here. All right. So now we will go to uh, Brian to go over our agenda. Thank you, Mary. And again, thanks everyone for joining. Um, we have a great group today on, on the webinar. Um, so I will be beginning the, the session with a general overview of the Fed State Partnership for State Repair Program. Um, in that first section, I'll explain the general program requirements and project and applicant eligibility information and, and related uh, material. Um, then I'll be passing to my colleague, uh, Matt, Matthew Laura, to go through instructions on how to apply and some of the key websites and materials that we'll need there. And then the kind of second half of the presentation will cover a range of best practices um, for you all to consider as you're preparing applications. And in, in that section, we'll talk about your product narrative, statement of work, preparing benefit cost analyses, and um, environmental readiness. And we hope to allow a good chunk of time at the end to get to all of your questions. And with that, I'm actually going to hand it back to Mary, I think, to start off our, our polls for the day. Absolutely. We have two polls to start with. Poll one is, what type of organization do you represent? A, state, B, interstate compact, C, public agency or publicly chartered authority, D, local government, E, Amtrak, F, industry consultant, G, other. And we'll just give that a few moments more. All right, thank you all so much. So it looks like we've got about 20% have come from state today, 24% um, from public agency or publicly chartered authority, 3% from local government, and 3% from Amtrak, 32% from the industry or consultant, and 17% from other. Our next polling question is, have you participated in any previous FRA federal state partnership program webinars? Yes, I've participated in a live partnership program webinar. B, yes, I've watched a recorded partnership program webinar online. Or C, no, I have not previously attended or watched any partnership program webinars. All right, thank you all so much. It looks like we've got about 42% who have participated in a live webinar. Um, and we've got 4% that have watched one online, but 54% 54, 54 of participants today have not uh, participated or um, watched any of the previous partnership program webinars. And that's our last polling question for this segment, and now we'll be going back to Brian. Okay, thank you, Mary. Um, and very interesting to see that a good diversity of attendees and um, a, a fairly large proportion of you who have not um, attended one of these before, which is always excellent. We'd love to, to hear about new, new interest in the, in the program. So as I said, again, um, I'm gonna start with a overview of the Federal State Partnership for State Good Repair Program. Um, and we'll get into the questions of eligibility, what types of projects uh, this program looks to fund. And I'm going to begin that by describing the kind of key purpose 
uh, and focus of the federal state partnership program. And I will probably refer to it variously as the fed state partnership program or just the partnership program rather than the, the full name here throughout the, um, the presentation. And we'll start with kind of the core purpose. So Congress has authorized this, this program to fund capital projects across the US um, focused on repairing, replacing, or rehabilitating certain qualified railroad assets to reduce the Sega repair backlog and improve inner city passenger rail performance. As a bunch of terms there, um, qualified railroad assets I will talk about later, but in general, we are talking about um, uh, capital projects to improve state of repair or improve inner city passenger rail performance. Um, new this year, and I'll get into it in a bit, we also can fund um, some pre-construction costs, but we, it is a, a capital focused um, program. And the notice of funding opportunity that we just published, uh, it published last week on December 7th, uh, made $198 million available from fiscal year 2021 congressional appropriations. And we have established a 90 day application period. So applications will be due at 5 p.m. on March 7th of 2022. And we do allow concurrent applications or resubmissions. So if you previously submitted in a prior round of the partnership program and were unsuccessful, you can resubmit that project if you wish. Um, and concurrent meaning you could submit an application to this program that you might have recently submitted and could be pending with another USDOT program, such as perhaps the, the CRISI, FRA's uh, Consolidated Railroad Infrastructure and Safety Improvements Program, or, or RAISE, which is the, the Rebuilding American Infrastructure with Sustainability and Equity Grants that's run by um, the Office of the Secretary. Um, you know, CRISI, for example, just closed its application period. So there are some, perhaps some projects there that you might have submitted that you'd be considering also submitting to Fed State. You are allowed to do that. We just simply request that you tell us um, if you're submitting something that has been submitted to another program. And then I have an important note uh, right up front, uh, a process note that I want to make sure all of you are aware of which is the NOFO that we published, the notice published on December 7th was unfortunately and inadvertently incomplete. It was missing a couple of sections of, of text that we intended to, to be there. Um, we ask if you pulled down the NOFO and downloaded it and are working from the copy from December 7th, I think as you prepared your actual application, you'd realize it was missing some information, but we I please, please, please request that you go download our updated and complete NOFO that we reissued on December 10th, so last Friday. That link to the correct and complete document is here on the slide, but it is also in the web links pod that Mary described below, um, down on, I think it's number seven in the web links pod. So you could go ahead and do that right now and have the correct document. If you have the document open, you should note section D was the area where some information was missing. Um, it should actually provide the application submission information. Um, they're also on the correct NOFO. Um, there's a note right in the introduction section that says this document supersedes the submission from December 7th so that uh, um, you, you know you're working with the correct, the correct document. Now back into the partnership program. Um, so for those of you, whoops, Sorry, it skipped ahead on me there. For those of you who are familiar with um, the partnership program previously, this slide should be helpful to explain the key changes going into fiscal 21 as compared to prior years like fiscal year 2020, 2019, 2018, other rounds. And there's sort of three big uh, notes for you. The first is these funds for the 198 million we're making available here for the first time in the partnership program allows for eligibility for pre-construction projects. So we have eligibility for projects to design, engineer, survey, map, um, do environmental studies, acquire rights of way um, under this, this notice. And you can apply for those projects independently. So just for the pre-construction elements or in conjunction with um, also making a request for funding for construction. 
Uh, we also updated the key departmental objectives, and those, those updates reflect the Biden-Harris administration's priorities. Um, so you'll see that described in the NOFO as well about the, the, the new focus areas and objectives of the administration. And an important note uh, to try to avoid any confusion for you, um, there, you know, I'm sure you heard recently about the bipartisan infrastructure legislation that was that was enacted by Congress and the President uh, last month. This round of funding for which and that funding did impact the amount of funding for the Fed State Partnership Program going forward, but these funds were already appropriated and um, authorized under the existing Fix, Fixing America's Surface Transportation Act that passed back in 2015. And we will be administering the fiscal year 21 funds under that authority, um, the authority in place at the time they were uh, appropriated. So the, the other expanded funding eligibilities that's proposed and enacted now in the bipartisan law will not apply to these, to these funds. So just making that clear. And it also, of course, we're limited to just 198 million. It is not the larger funding amounts contemplated with the new, uh, in the new bill. Um, so there's a definition section in the NOFO. I encourage you to be care to carefully read all of that. I'm just pulling out a few key definitions for you to be to be aware of. There are sort of two flavors of what a capital project means in this program. One is a project that would be primarily intended to replace, rehabilitate, or repair um, major assets that are used in inner city passenger rail service. The other flavor is is a project that is just you know, intended, uh, primarily intended to improve inner city passenger rail performance. An emphasis here, um, it, you notice inner city passenger rail is mentioned in both of those flavors. Uh, the partnership program does require that there are benefits to inner city passenger rail um, resulting from the project. They can be shared benefit projects with other types of rail users, commuter or freight, but there has to be an inner city passenger rail benefit, has to be on the part, a portion of the rail network that inner city passenger rail uses. Um, and we also have a definition of a major capital project in the program. And that threshold is um, you're a major, you'd be proposing a major capital project if your total project cost exceeds $300 million. Um, then there's the definition of stake and repair, which I indicate here because again, there's a focus uh, here on projects to bring assets into a stake and repair, rehabilitate, repair assets. And there's a definition of what stake repair means. And when you're proposing or thinking about projects, you'll actually want to be thinking about the ways in which the assets or project that you're proposing is not presently in a stake repair. So it's not presently meeting um, the definition you see here on the slide. And then there's an important geographic element in the program. Um, there's different eligibility between projects on the Northeast Corridor, which is the main line, Boston to uh, Washington, D.C., and for projects elsewhere across the network. Um, and so I'm just noting here, that actually, Northeast Corridor in this program encompasses that main line, um, Boston to, to Washington, as well as um, some Amtrak-owned branch lines between Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and Philadelphia, Springfield, Massachusetts, and New Haven, New York, and uh, Spite and Dival and uh, New York Penn Station. So now we'll talk about um, eligibility. So you need to be, oops, uh, you'll need to be an eligible applicant to receive a grant under the program, and those eligible applicants are listed here. Uh, the I think all these are self-explanatory. The the one I will explain is a political subdivision of a state means things like a county or municipal or city government. Um, that's generally who is who's intended by that definition. And in the partnership program, we do have a selection preference um, when we receive applications that are submitted by multiple eligible applicants. So if you are partnering, you know, if multiple states partner or Amtrak partners with the state or at any any combination, um, if you come in as a, on a jointly submitted project, which I'll discuss in the next slide, that does have a selection preference with it. If you're not an eligible entity yourself, if you're a private sector firm or, or you know, perhaps a freight railroad, um, you may be included as a project partner, but you cannot be the lead applicant on the submission because you will not be directly eligible to receive funding. 
If you are contemplating doing a joint application, you must identify who the lead applicant is going to be. That lead applicant would be intended to serve as the point of contact and the uh, presumptive grant recipient if you're selected for award. You need to identify all of the parties that are joining the application as joint applicants. Uh, the method for doing that is to get a signed letter of statement from an authorized representative of each of those uh, those entities, and it, it needs to be it needs to be more precise about joining the application as a joint applicant, not just sort of a generic letter of support. And if it's Amtrak in a state, um, they or one or more states, they actually should submit a cooperative agreement, which can still take the form of a letter but the same document signed by all parties. So including sort of the lead and the joint applicants all signing the same um, agreement about being involved in the project. And we do ask like in those letters or in those agreements that you identify the expected roles and responsibilities. Um, so, and, and the, the specific role of a joint applicant is at your discretion. We do not have a particular requirement about how a joint applicant has to participate in the project. Um, you know, and so some roles are provided here. Maybe they provide matching funds. Maybe they're carrying out or implementing a part of the project. Um, but you should describe what the expected uh, roles and responsibilities for project management and funding, et cetera, um, are intended to be if you're submitting a joint application. The non-federal match requirements for funding um, is there's a minimum requirement requirement of 20% non-federal match, or as it shows in the slide, meaning that the federal share cannot exceed 80%. Um, so whatever your total overall cost of the project is, uh, your request to the partnership program cannot exceed 80% of that cost. You must present 20% or more non-federal, non state, local, private uh, uh, funds. Um, we do accept cash contributions for non-federal match and commitments um, and also in kind so non non cash contributions are permitted uh, you can refer to the code of federal regulations part 200 that that governs federal grant making if you want to read more about uh, matching provisions and and how in kind contributions should be considered um, if app if amtrak is applying it is also specifically permitted to use ticket or other non-federal revenues as non-federal matching funds and we do, of course, ask that you uh, carefully identify the sourcing of any of the funds um, and dis clearly and distinctly reflect those in your project budget so that we know how much funding is being committed from each of the matching sources um, or each of the matching organizations, what the sources of those funds are, uh, so that we can understand very clearly that you meet this eligibility requirement of at least a 20% non-federal um, match. And again, there is a selection preference here for 50% or greater non-federal match. So if you were able to uh, provide 50% or more of the funding, um, that can get you a selection preference. Now I'll talk about project eligibility. So um, again, we start with the notion of capital projects with the new allowance this year to allow for preliminary engineering, environmental review, or other pre-construction documents. Um, either on their own or in conjunction with the construction project. Uh, it has to meet the qualified railroad asset definition. I'm going to cover that in the next couple slides. And then you need to be doing um, the following types of activities, you know, replacing assets in kind or replacing in kind and then with assets also increase capacity, or provide a higher level of service. Um, you could propose a project that allows service to be maintained while a set of assets are brought into a stake or repair. Um, and then just sort of gen generally projects that would bring assets into state of repair. And when you're contemplating your project um, here, we would anticipate that many partnership projects would do one or more of these. Um, but you should, you know, ensure that your your um, your project is is carrying out one of those activities. Now I'll talk about a qualified railroad asset. So this is the universe of assets that are going to be eligible under this program for, for us to fund. And it's, it's pretty broad in some respects and then limited in, in certain other respects. So I will describe that. Um, 
in the in the broad sense it does cover kind of the full range of railroad infrastructure so fixed assets like track and ballast and bridges and structures and tunnels um, along railroad rights of way uh, rail equipment whether maintenance of way equipment or revenue passenger rolling stock or facilities so maintenance facilities uh, passenger stations or other related um, railroad facilities and that's pretty pretty broad a pretty you know wide range of infrastructure equipment and facility assets um, they do have to be used in inner city passenger rail service again we have to have an inner city passenger rail benefit and then the ways in which they are more limited are these three provisions so the ownership and control must be under excuse me an, an eligible applicant must own and control the assets so we are limited to the universe of railroad assets that are owned by you know states or amtrak or other public agencies as in the list of the eligible applicants and there are planning and cost allocation policy uh requirements that i'll cover on the next uh two slides and i mentioned earlier but we're also looking for assets not on a state repair so in general we'd be looking for assets that um, you know, we're not just recently updated or improved, but in, instead are in serious need of rehabilitation. So if you are someone who would be proposing a non-Northeast corridor project, so at anything not in that immediate, you know, Northeast mainline spine, to demonstrate project eligibility and show that you meet the qualified railroad asset criteria, um, you kind of go through this flow chart. So, uh, and if you're reading the NOFO, this is described in somewhat more detail in section D. Um, so you'll see this, you'll see information about project eligibility there. And so first, that requirement for ownership and control, you either can directly own the assets um, or you can show that you have control over them, such as like long-term lease or maintenance away agreements um, relating to the infrastructure of facility. Um, in the non-NEC universe for a planning document, we would look to see that the project is contained in the relevant state rail plans. So if you're proposing a project from, you know, uh, New York, we, we might look, or uh, Texas or something, we would look to the state rail plans of those states to see that the project is in there. You'd want to demonstrate that it is. Uh, or if it's not, you can point to other planning documents, um, such as perhaps quarter planning documents or uh, a regional area plan document that shows that this is a, a railroad project you've been contemplating um, and planning to undertake or um, and somewhat simpler um, for many times if a state especially if a state is applying you can amend your state rail plan by sending a letter in with your application to amend and add the project into your state rail plan um, that's also described in the NOFO about how you can you can do that and if you're not in the northeast corridor um, from a policy cost sharing policy perspective, we would look first to see if the project is on a route that is subject to the, the PREA, Passenger Rail Investment and Improvement Act of 2008, um, Section 209 policy. Uh, or if not that, you would demonstrate uh, that the assets in the project are similar, subject to a similar agreement. So that could mean um, maybe you have a station where there's an existing maintenance agreement and a cost sharing agreement between the users of the station, including the IPR provider, and that's a longstanding agreement and shows that if we upgraded them, uh, there'd continue to be you know, a cost sharing agreement related to those assets. And then I mentioned the, the state of repair, and that would be the same for the Northeast Corridor 1 on the next slide. So in the Northeast, the same flow chart, just slightly different uh, requirements, no difference on ownership and control, but it's a different planning document. We would look to the Northeast Quarter Commission's five-year capital investment plan. And if a project is not listed there, uh, it can be shown in an equivalent plan document, or um, that capital investment plan could be updated to include the project. And the policy basis is different in the, in the in Northeast as well. Uh, instead of the Section 209, it relates to Section 212 of PREA, which is the Northeast Corridor uh, Commuter Inner City Rail Cost Allocation Policy. Uh, finally, or in my last couple of slides here on the overview, um, when you come to evaluation selection, so when you're thinking about how will my project be assessed, um, we've specified here the evaluation criteria, and we 
we'll, we will evaluate all the projects received, all the applications received for technical merit and for project benefits. And I've listed most, although not all, you should ver again verify and check in the NOFO for the full material, but um, most of the material that we consider under technical merit, so, you know, and project benefits. So technical merit looks at the quality of the materials, the readiness of the overall project, um, past performance and technical capacity of your organization, um, you know, qualifications of personnel and other sort of technical basis um, criteria. And then project benefits looks more at like, what are the outcomes of this project? So the benefit cost analysis that Judah will discuss, and then just also generally, what are the effects of this project on railroad performance, safety, competitiveness, and other benefits and outcomes from the project? And uh, I've mentioned these, but there are three uh, selection, statutory selection preferences. First, that um, where Amtrak's not a sole applicant, which sort of goes along with item number two for a preference for applications jointly submitted by multiple applicants. And I mentioned in the matching, 50% uh, or greater non-federal match is also a preference. And then I mentioned new for 2021 is the revised uh, key departmental objectives. Those are described here on the slide. You can see the kind of key focus areas. DOT is focused on safety, uh, economic strength and economic contributions from the project, addressing climate change, um, addressing racial equity and economic inclusion and um, bringing about transformation in, in the nation's transportation infrastructure. So again, as you contemplate your project, um, you want to think about how your project would connect to these focus areas. And finally, for me, um, just a few other requirements, restrictions to keep in mind. Uh, one is sort of consistent with general federal grant making. Um, we do not support pre-award costs, or sorry, excuse me, um, costs that you've incurred prior to selection or without a NEPA determination are generally not allowable. Um, we also cannot, I've mentioned a couple times about the shared benefit perspective. Uh, we're not able in the partnership program to fund sole benefit commuter or freight projects. Again, there has to be an inner city passenger rail connection um, and benefit from the project. We are able to fund projects in shared corridors where commuter or freight might benefit. We have done that uh, several times under the, under the program. Um, we've even provided grants to commuter or local transit agencies in some instances where, as I note here, um, those agencies would de could demonstrate that their projects had a reasonable um, benefit for inner city passenger rail. And of course they met the qualified railroad asset uh, requirements I went through. And then if you are a Northeast corridor project, uh, we do have a, a requirement during project implementation, implementation and delivery that you re remain compliant with that Northeast corridor cost allocation policy um, throughout the duration of your project. And with that, I am going to hand it off to uh, Matt to go through the next set of how to apply instructions. Thanks, Brian. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna, we're, as you guys can see, we're covering a lot of information today. Uh, I'm going to touch on a couple things here, uh, specifically, you know, what is a NOFO? How do you find a NOFO? What's in the NOFO? And then after reading it, how do you move forward with applying for a a grant? So, um, you know, for, for for those of you that have, you know, applied for or received. Uh, federal financial assistance in the past, um, the NOFO is the Notice of Fund Funding Opportunity, uh, and it's outlined um, very specifically in the Uniform Guidance uh, 2 CFR 200, which is the federal government grant guidance, per se. Um, it's also, at times, you'll hear it called uh, other things, uh, such as um, it can be called the program announcement, a solicitation, notice of funding availability, but you know, generally NOFO is notice of funding opportunity. Uh, so, so it does announce the availability of a grant program and it contains you know, all the details necessary for you to apply for that announcement. <clears throat> um, you know, what information can you find in the NOFO? It's, again, very specifically regulated by the uniform guidance um, you know, 
on the screen, you can see program summary, key dates, addresses, contact information. I mean, really, it provides the information on uh, who is eligible to apply, you know, what is the evaluation criteria for selection, uh, what are the required forms or components of your application, and then how do you move forward with submitting an application. Um, again, you know, if you've applied for any other federal grant programs, these should follow the same table of contents that you're seeing there on the right side of the screen. Those are outlined specifically and required by the Uniform Guidance 2 CFR 200. So you'll see a very you know, repetitive flow that if, if you've viewed these before, it's going to follow much the same pattern. Um, where do I start? How do I find the NOFO? Um, we generally recommend folks start by going to FRA's Grants and Loans website. Uh, as you can see, the hyperlink here at the top of the screen. Also, if you Google FRA Grants, it is generally the, the first you know, option that pops up. Uh, we post all of our current NOFOs on our website. Uh, we are also required by law to post them on grants.gov, uh, as well as we put them in the Federal Register. I'll we'll kind of show you each one of those where they go. But if you go to FRA's Grants and Loans website, uh, on the Competitive Discretionary Grants page, we always put those programs that are currently accepting applications at the top. You can also scroll down through other programs that may not be uh, currently open, but have been open in the past, uh, further down the screen. Uh, right now, Fed State Partnership is the only grant program accepting applications. So you'll notice uh, when you go to that site, it'll be the only one at the very top under accepting applications. Uh, as you can see here, highlighted in the screen, um, you know, right above where you would be able to register for this webinar that you're doing right now would actually be the, the current version of the NOFO. As Brian had hit on earlier on, uh, we put one out on December 7th that was missing a little bit of information. It came back out in the Federal Register on the 10th and was actually updated in grants.gov on the 13th. So just you know, always make sure that you're working from the most recent version. As Brian said, we, we kind of highlighted that language you know, right there in the beginning of the NOFO to let you know that you're working from the most recent one. Uh, on our website, it will be the most recent. Um, and grants.gov, I'll show you guys how to make sure you get to the most recent when we get to those screens. Uh, so this is the first place I always tell people to go. Um, you know, before you even worry about grants.gov or how to apply, it's you need to read the NOFO in its entirety to make sure you understand, you know, what we're looking for in this program, you know, the information that you're going to need to be able to provide. That is always step one. Find the NOFO, read it in its entirety, and then you can move forward on, on to the rest of the process. Uh, Secondary from FRA's website, uh, the, the initial NOFO and revised NOFO were both posted to the Federal Register. Uh, so it's just a secondary place you can go find it. it. I think it's easier to find on our website and I'd recommend you going there. Uh, but if you went to the Federal Register, you know, you could, you could pull it up there as well. Uh, a couple things here, we highlight it from the first page of the NOFO is that once you get into grants.gov and you want to search for this, there, you're going to need the assistance listing number, which used to be called a CFDA number, for those of you that may be more familiar with that term. So here, uh, it's hard to see on this, at least on my screen, but it's 20.326. So you'll want to keep that number handy for reference. And when you get into grants.gov, that is the easiest way to search and find this uh, announcement. Also, note there, uh, we highlighted the due date, uh, which is March 7th, and it's 5 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, just make sure everyone notes that is a Monday. Uh, generally, you know, the federal offices and the grants.gov help desk are not available over weekends. So if you push your application out to the, the last couple days there, you know, two of those last three days are, are not federal business days and you probably won't be able to get anyone to help. I really recommend, you know, as, as a best practice that you guys come in and submit early if possible. Um, you know, so in this case, if you could get it in by that Friday before, you know, it, it saves you guys from working over the weekend and then potentially not having someone around to answer your questions on, on the over the weekend or that last day where we generally get hit pretty hard with questions and we try to get through them all as quick as we can, but sometimes it's hard to do. Yeah, I'm going to turn it over to Mary. All right. Thanks, Matt. So we're going to be looking at poll number three now open this up and it says, do you have experience using grants.gov? A, yes, extensive, B, yes, limited, and C, no experience.
All right. It looks like uh, on today's call we have, uh, or today's webinar, excuse me, we have 27% have extensive, 32% have limited, and 41% have no experience. All right, uh, Matt, I believe it's coming back to you. Yep, thanks, Mary. All right, so we have, uh, I mean, based on that poll, a pretty good mix here of folks who, who this is, you know, not new at all to some, some folks who have not touched this. Uh, you know, we were almost a, a third, a third, and a third there, so a good mix. Um, so, I, you know, I said, I would recommend folks starting with the FRA grants website to read the NOFO. You know, you know you're all here because you're interested in it. I assume, you know, many of you will apply for it. So you've read the NOFO, you've determined, yes, I have a project that is eligible. I am an eligible entity. I want to submit an application. What do I do next? So, as I said, grants.gov is legally our one-stop shop for, for grant announcements and where we expect uh, applicants to go in and submit their application. So here, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, they still use the CFTA instead of assistance listing term. You'll see it kind of uh, used both ways depending on which site you're on. Uh, assistance listing is the new term, but you'll want to put in 20.326 search. That is by far and away the easiest way to make sure you get to the correct uh, NOFO funding announcement. Obviously, if you forgot that, you could also do some keyword searches. If you scroll down below, you could search by Department of Transportation. You could search by agency, Federal Railroad Administration. There's a lot of different ways to search within grants.gov, but if you know the assistance listing slash CFDA number, that is you know, by far the, the easiest way to ensure you end up at the right funding opportunity. So in this case, you know, we entered 20.326, hit search, and the you know, one and only under that assistance listing number comes up. It is our current FY21 Fence State Partnership. And you'll just want to click on the opportunity number to move forward, and you'll get to a screen where you can see four different tabs. A synopsis just has you know, some high-level information from within the NOFO. Uh, you know, what the program name is, you know, how much money is available, when it was posted, when it's due, uh, you know, very high level information. Um, here, if you went to the version history tab, you would actually be able to see the, and sorry, we don't have this in the screenshots, we just have synopsis, but uh, there you'd be able to see that, you know, we have, you know, a synopsis one that went out on December 7th and a synopsis two that was updated in grants.gov on December 13th. Uh, and, and there you can use the link, make sure you're under December 13th, and you can again get to the NOFO as, there as well. Uh, a related documents tab and package tab. Uh, again, no screenshots, but I just want to re reference there. Um, oftentimes you'll see the NOFO under the related documents as well as some of the FRA specific forms. And the package is where you would actually then be able to click to, um, right now you'll notice the apply button is grayed out in this screenshot. Uh, I just noticed right at the beginning of this webinar, uh, we don't have this actually set up for you guys to apply yet. So that's an issue on our side, um, but you can actually get to the NOFO, you can read it again, and, and probably by the end of the day, we'll have the apply button activated for you guys. Uh, but if you went to the package, that's where you can actually start your, your process to apply for the grant, downloading the, the grants.gov forms that you can then you know fill out on your own and resubmit into their portal. So. A couple tabs there that we didn't cover, but I can tell you the related documents and package are empty at the moment. Uh, we're going to get those fixed by the end of the day. Um, okay, so again, you're in grants.gov. You found the NOFO. You found the announcement. How do I actually go, go through the process of applying? Well, in order to apply, there's three different things that you need to set up in advance of being able to click apply. Uh, the first one is obtain a Duns and Bradstreet number. Um, for those of you that are aware, the government is has historically used the Duns and Bradstreet number to track uh, our entities. It's uh, like giving you a social security number. Uh, we're moving towards a, a different tracking identifier called a unique entity identifier, UEI. But right now we're kind of in the process where you can get both a Duns and a UEI. Uh, the Duns is still the one that is required at this point in time uh, until April 22nd. So, you know, we'll move to the UEI for, for future iterations, but for this particular NOFO and announcement period, we still need to make sure you guys have a DUNS number. 
Uh, so just to clarify there, for those of you that heard about the upcoming UEI, it's not required until April. Make sure you have a DUNS number for this go round. Uh, the DUNS number can take you know, a couple of weeks to get in. So again, here, if you're thinking about applying, but you're not sure, start the DUNS process now if you don't already have one. Uh, if you get to the end of the process, if you get to March 7th and your DUNS hasn't been confirmed or your SAM registration hasn't been confirmed, that is not rationale for us to extend the deadline. Uh, once you guys get a DUNS number, the second thing you would wanna do is register in the federal government's system for award management. We call it SAM.gov. Again, this can take up to uh, about two weeks. Uh, anywhere right this right now, it can happen as quickly as a week, but you know, I budget up to two weeks just in case. Again, if you're thinking about applying, anyone who does business with the federal government, whether that be through a contract, a grant, a cooperative agreement, must be registered in SAM.gov. So if you're thinking about applying, start that process now. Just get it out of the way. It, you know, if you're going to apply for any future grants, whether it be with FRA, another DOT agency, or even another department, you're going to need to have this regardless. So uh, those two take a little bit of time, but you know, get started on them early. Uh, the last third thing is a grants.gov authorized organization representative profile, AOR. And that is essentially your username and password to grants.gov for the person who is eligible to submit applications on behalf of your organization. That one does not take as long, um, but you know, again, we don't wanna wait till the last minute either. So you need all three of those things in order to you know, actually go in and click submit in grants.gov. Um, you know, the, the harder part that, that you know, we're, we're covering in, in the rest of all the breakouts today is, you know, how do I complete the application? How do I address all the requirements of the forms? So, you know, you got to read the NOFO in its entirety. I'll say that several more times, I'm sure, and make sure you address each of the requirements. Um, so for the Fest State Partnership Program, FY21, what are our required documents? Uh, so here you'll see the list. Um, you know, we're going to actually give you additional best practices on how to complete most of these. Uh, so I'm not going to go into much detail, but you know, there's a project narrative, statement of work, NEPA documentation, benefit cost analysis. Now uh, we don't have a breakout with more information on the ownership agreement, but essentially if you are proposing a project on right of way that is owned by another railroad or another entity that is not the applicant, you need to have an agreement with that entity to, to you know, use the right of way for your project. Um, that does not need to be, and Brian, I'm sorry, correct me if I'm wrong here, but that does not need to be complete at the time of application, but it will need to be complete in order for you to move forward with an obligation on an award. Um, so th those are ones that we're gonna talk, oh, go ahead, sorry. I thought, sorry, I thought I heard him chiming in. Uh, so those yeah, are the forms that, you know. That's, that's correct. Thanks, Brian. So those are not so much forms as much as they're a little more sometimes open, open ended content that we're gonna kind of walk you through. We have some templates on our, on our website in a lot of cases, but we're gonna walk you through the best practices on, the, on those required documents. The second page is more, you know, directed that there are forms that you can just fill out. So the top two, or three, sorry, three, which is the SF-424, and then either the A or C, and either the B or D, uh, those are OMB forms that are, that are already built into grants.gov and available through grants.gov. Uh, the FRA forms, the second and third bullet there, the, the FRA F-30 and FRA F-251, are also required for all applicants. They are gonna be found either on the related documents tab in grants.gov, or on FRA's Grants and Loans website. Uh, so there, if you were to just to log on to the Grants and Loans website and go to the Applying for Grants page, we have links to both of those forms for you there since they are FRA forms, but again, a PDF that you would just answer questions and fill out. Uh, the last one here, the SFLLL, which is a lobbying disclosure form, uh, is only required if you have reportable lobbying activities. If you are trying to certify that you do not have reportable lobbying activities, that is done so through the FRA F30. So the SFLLL is optional only for those that have reportable lobbying activities. Everything above that, the two FRA forms and the SF424 family of forms are required for all applications. 
And again, if you've applied for any FRA grants, you will have filled these out previously. Sorry, with the exception of the 251, which is new. Uh, if you've applied for grants across any federal agencies, you'll be familiar with the SF-424 family of forms. Okay, so, you know, you've actually gone through, you, you've completed all those required documents on the previous two pages. Um, you know, you're having an issue either completing a for, downloading the forms out of grants.gov or, or uploading them back into grants.gov and clicking apply. Um, there's two, two spots here. These are, this is at the very bottom of the synopsis page on grants.gov. The link to additional information just takes you back to the NOFO and, and FRA contact information. Uh, the bottom link there that we circled at the, you know, the grants.gov customer support, they can help you with the technical issues. So this is where I like to say, if your question is, how do I complete a form? I don't understand the question. I don't know what, how to answer it. You're going to want to come to FRA. We can help you answer it. If you know how to answer the question, but the form won't let you input it, or you filled out the form and you can't upload it back into grants.gov, those are technical issues. You're going to want to go to grants.gov for those. So if it's a how do I answer, FRA. If it's a how do I get it into the system, grants.gov. And as you'll see here, you know, they are, uh, you know, they have more operating capabilities than, you know, FRA as a whole. You'll see the hours of operation are, are generally 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but they are closed on certain federal holidays, et cetera. Uh, again, try not to push, push your luck and go to the last minute if you don't have to. Uh, apply early. I'll, I'll repeat that best practice as many times as I can. Um, and in this case, the FRA staff will, as I said, not be available on Saturday and Sunday before the due date on Monday. So the earlier, the better for applications. Okay. Uh, and then one of the big questions that we get here, which is not the intent of the webinar, but, but we like to hit on is, so I've submitted my application. Now what happens? Uh, so you'll see here that, you know, we, we take the first cut of applications. And the first thing we're checking for is what we call intake and eligibility, which is simply, is it an, from an eligible entity for an eligible project? Have they included all the required forms? If the answer to any of those is no, well, that application is then, you know, cut out and considered not eligible because it was not an eligible entity, it's not an eligible project, or they did not comply with the NOFO and provide all the required forms. Assuming you get yes to all three of those, we move forward to step two, you know, which is an evaluation. Again, we like to lay out, well, I can't say we like to, we are required to lay out the evaluation criteria and the NOFO. Uh, so that tells you exactly how we're going to then evaluate and score. Um, this is where most folks, you know, we'll call it the racking and stacking. We're going to see which, which product, which projects, um, you know, meet the requirements of the program and, and provide, you know, the most bang for the buck is what we like to say sometimes. So that's an evaluation process with a panel of subject matter experts uh, from both the Federal Railroad Administration, DOT, other agencies, uh, you know, various subject matter experts that we uh, ha have on hand to evaluate these applications. Uh, final funding decisions are made in number three. Uh, again, based on that selection criteria outlined in the NOFO, uh, selections are, are formalized and approved. And then in number four, you, you know, we will put out a formal press announcement uh, notifying the, those applicants that were selected for funding. Uh, notice in number four, that can be up to four to five months following the application due date. It takes quite a bit of time to, you know, we generally get a, lot, a fair amount of applications uh, to, to go through them all, score them, get, get final approvals on selections. It is a lengthy period of time. So, you know, when this closes March 7th, you know, just know that, you know, you're, you're looking sometime, you know, certainly into, into the late summer, maybe even fall before these announcements come out. So don't be getting too antsy if, if a couple months go by and you haven't heard anything yet. Um, you know, obviously you can track your application on grants.gov. Uh, generally, it'll just let you know that your application has been received by the federal agency. It doesn't give a lot more information than that, but at least it confirms to you that we have it and it's part of our review. Uh, you know, if we're really getting several months out and you haven't heard anything, I mean, you can reach out to us and we can very quickly tell you whether or not announcements have been made and again, provide them to you. Um, they will, obviously you'll, you'll be notified directly if you receive a selection. Otherwise, the announcements are always posted again on our grants and loans website on FRA's page. 
So that's what I have for you guys today. I'm going to hand it back to Brian, I believe. And, uh, you know, I'll watch the chat for questions and, and hang out to answer as many as we can. Thanks for your time, guys. Oops, sorry, Brian. I got one more page. Uh, that, that last screen, if you want more detailed information, it's on our website. Okay, thank you, Matt. Um, all right, so uh, that was sort of the program overview and instructions on how to apply. Uh, now we're going to cover um, a range of best practices. So, you know, I'll start, of course, with the, the very first one, which is read the NOFO carefully to understand all the criteria. We, we've, we've done our best to try to make the NOFO a one-stop shop for all the program requirements and information. And now we're going to go through briefly um, some best practices regarding the project narrative, uh, preparing a statement of work, doing your benefit cost analysis, and um, uh, preparing and, and submitting environmental readiness information. So I'll walk through on the project narrative. And the project narrative, um, we give this outline in the NOFO. And uh, you are strongly encouraged to just simply uh, you know, send this outline right back to us. Uh, cover page, the summary, funding, eligibility, et cetera, describing your project. And the narrative is kind of a core document of your application. It's uh, We have a 25-page limit, but it's a place where you get to provide, you know, in narrative structure, explain what your project is, why it should be funded, why it's a good fit for this program, why it's eligible for this program, um, and kind of all the core data um, fits in, should fit into to the narrative. Uh, and again, encourage you to simply follow the outline, and I'll walk through some highlights of what you should include. The biggest one on the cover page, um, I think we say explicitly what to include, but re-emphasize that if you are doing a resubmission uh, if you've recently submitted if you submit this application in a prior year or you are submitting uh, concurrently with another department program please include that info right there on the cover page so we know if this same application uh, has been submitted elsewhere if you've if you've modified it if you're submitting to the partnership program a similar application but still different you can e also include a note about that to say you know, a portion of this was submitted to Chrissy, but the Fed State application includes XYZ additional um, information. We do ask for a, a project summary. Um, a, you know, give us the brief summation of what your project is. You can kind of think of this as your elevator pitch. You know, what what is the core problem you're looking to solve? What is your project proposing to do? What is the proposed outcome of the project? Um, uh, that's that's a that's sort of first introduction and can be a shorthand for how your project is referenced. So think about that. You know, how do you summarize what you're doing with your project? Um, of course, include detailed information about project funding. As I mentioned before, um, you will want to include the all the sourcing information. So for any non-federal um, match amounts and of course how much money you are actually requesting from the Fed State Partnership Program. It's very important. Um, it, you are encouraged to attach with your application any funding commitment letters from those not, you know, your partners that might be contributing funding. And I'm skipping the applicant project eligibility since we covered that in the program overview up front, but there are detailed instructions about that in this section of the NOFO. And then um, build on your project summary. We also ask for a detailed project description. This is your opportunity to more thoroughly describe what your project is, what it's doing, what is the scope, what's the outcomes, how will it be carried out, you know, are there project components that are related to each other um, and elements. You can include photographs and diagrams showing the current conditions of assets or renderings of the of the proposed improved condition. Um, and we do ask that you you include in your description all of the host railroads, so all of the railroad owners and operators um, of the equipment, facility, or infrastructure involved in the project, um, even if they're not an applicant, right? Even if they're if it's if maybe it's a freight railroad company that operates there but isn't involved in the project, we still want you to include um, everyone who, who regularly operates over the infrastructure. 
Uh, project location, of course, the basic information like city, counties, and states. I do ask that uh, it's very helpful if you include a map. In fact, oftentimes it's very helpful to include you know, maybe two maps, one that's a closer in detail and one a wider context map, setting it in the context of, say, of the metropolitan area or the general region of the state, and then one that's more focused on the exact project area. Uh, you can identify the railroad mileposts at, or relevant subdivisions of the railroad to help explain where it is. And if you are proposing grade crossing projects, we require that you do send in the uh, crossing numbers from the USDOT inventory. Um, so please include the crossing numbers for any of the grade crossings you'd be proposing to improve. In your narrative, you want to talk about how your project meets the evaluation selection criteria. So I encourage you to make this a separate section in your narrative and to affirmatively argue for your project and say, we meet the evaluation plan or uh, the evaluation selection criteria in the following ways. Um, you can summarize here information coming from your benefit cost analysis or other areas of your um, of your submission. Uh, we will look for a description of past experience managing similar grants, what your proposed arrangements are for project implementation and management. You don't have to send in a full project management plan uh, by any means, but you know, if you have a general understanding, you know, we would be the grant recipient, we are going to directly carry out the project with our forces, or we are going to be the grant recipient, we'll be contracting out for project delivery. You can describe those general arrangements, you know, who will be involved in oversight, how are you managing risk um, in the project. And uh, Laura will talk a bit more about environmental readiness in a bit, but you would include some of this information in your narrative about where you are in the, the process. And we have highlighted here, just if you were applying for final design and construction, you know, you would indicate to us where you are in the NEPA process, um, where you are in environmental review. I'm also going to talk through uh, best practices on statements of work. Uh, so we have templates for this. So you'll want to go to our statement of work webpage. Um, the link is here on the slide. Um, we, you, you'll see on that page kind of the red box. I know it's small text, but the red box shows, you know, there's a, a statement of work, schedule, and budget templates that you can use. Um, and when you're preparing your statement of work, um, at the application level, we recognize you may not you may not have every last detail. Your statement of work might not be at the quality it would be when we would actually obligate a grant after selection. But you want to give your best um, draft of what you know, explaining the um, scope of the project and the timing and phases or task structure that you're proposing for how to carry out the project, any deliverables that you anticipate um, preparing with the funding. And uh, I emphasize here and throughout your application, always check your budget numbers um, in the statement of work and on the budget to make sure they all tick and tie out and you're, you have the same amount of information or the same money requested across your application. And then lastly, um, uh, lastly on capital costs, uh, if you are generating information about capital costs, we do have a guidance document for capital cost estimating. Uh, the link to that is here on the slide. We also have a worksheet with standard cost categories, which offers you a way to organize your scope of work and budget information. This is just a screenshot of, of something of what that kind of looks like. And using these templates, all of them, the, the scope of work, budget, um, and, and schedule materials can ensure consistency across your documents and consistency in review um, of your application. Now I'm going to hand it off to my colleague Judah to talk about BCAs. Thank you very much and uh, thank you everyone for your attention today. Apologize my voice is a little hoarse I'm getting over something but hopefully you'll be able to uh, hear me well and enjoy this uh, best practices on BCA. Um, I want to note here that uh, beyond the fact that you're required to submit a benefit cost analysis. It is the best way for us to uh, quantify and rank projects against each other in terms of benefits delivered. 
Um, also, the secretary must take into account for this program basically means that uh, a positive BCR is not a threshold in order for your project to be selected. Um, and this differs from other discretionary competitive programs the department has, uh, such as INFRA or RAISE, where the project must have a positive BCR to be selected. Here are the basic steps for developing your BCA. These are universal to all of USDOT's BCAs in development. I want to emphasize that your base case is the world without your project, and the build case is a single scenario, i.e. your project, not alternatives. You are applying to do something, not applying to maybe do a few different things. You know, be confident in your project and its benefits. Your project may have multiple components, and we would like for you to show independent utility, i.e. benefits and costs, for each. For example, if your project seeks to rehab a station platform, uh, add capacity to a parking garage, and eliminate a grade crossing near the station area, please provide separate costs and benefits for each of these components to the extent possible. You know, it is typical for some elements to be more cost beneficial than others. There's no reason to be concerned if that's the case with your project. Uh, we expect to see an analysis period between 20 to 30 years, you can capture residual value beyond that point. Marginal benefit, um, yes, marginal benefits are the key to your BCA. Your assumption should be plausible and tied directly to the project being applied for. Do not apply demand projections that will outgrow the physical capacity uh, limitations of your operation or the surrounding population by the end of the analysis period. A train set can only hold a certain number of riders and a local population of 200 cannot generate 2,000 daily riders immediately. Please use our USDOT guidance when calculating your BCR. You may have disbenefits or negative benefits, and you may also have negative operations and maintenance or O&M benefits. You should account for all of these accurately and congruent with the construction timeline you have laid out in your statement of work and the corresponding analysis period for your BCA. And again, please provide your benefits and costs for the sub-elements where applicable and document your assumptions and inputs. Use verifiable data and models and cite the source. For example, successful BCAs typically apply FRA safety data and models, uh, ridership demand or delay projections directly for, from the source, for example, from Amtrak. Engineering documentation that supports the need to replace an asset or history of O&M costs are helpful for verifying your analysis. Please feel free to include them. Uh, modal diversion should not be difficult to quantify. There is very discreet guidance from DOT on how to complete a modal diversion analysis. Benefits that accrue from new or induced users in a modal diversion scenario are, be, are to be accounted for at 50%. Benefits to existing users are to be accounted for at 100%. Lost revenue to other modes is a transfer. This is typically an issue we see applicants struggle with. Please read the guidance um, and adhere to the three basic things that I've laid out right now. Final advice, and this is probably a good time to mention that along with the typical benefit categories we see for BCA, such as safety and environmental improvements, you are welcome to discuss any benefits you feel your project may have that support the administration's priorities of creating good paying jobs, applying transformative technology, and addressing climate change and racial equity. Uh, although these types of benefits are not typically able to be quantified within the framework 
of the US DOT guidance. You are welcome to discuss them qualitatively in your application and also in the BCA. Um, and back to the recap, your BCA will be more competitive if you follow the guidance and provide a concise analysis that includes document documentation of assumptions and inputs. Uh, your project has great benefits, and it's simply a matter of quantifying them correctly and presenting them logically and concisely to us at the FRA. And that includes in providing a BCA model and an unlock spreadsheet so we can review and make corrections or adjustments as we feel are necessary. Um, links to the 2021 USDOT guidance and rail specific uh, scenarios can be found on this slide. Um, there is a previous uh, documentation or guidance directly from FRA on completing BCAs. While that is, uh, I believe it was released in 2016, while that is uh, helpful, maybe from a conceptual development standpoint, I want to point everyone to the latest 2021 USDOT guidance, especially in terms of input parameters, discounting, et cetera. That's where you want to start, and that's where you want to finish is the 2021 USDOT guidance. Um, I'm going to be turning the mic over to Laura Schick, who will be telling you about best practices for environmental readiness. Thank you. Thanks, Judah. Hi, everyone. Um, so yes, I'm going to talk just very briefly about FRA's environmental review process. We actually have entire webinars, you know, one to two or more hours on environmental topics, which you can check out. Um, I'll show you the slide later on where those are posted on our website. So today I'm just going to talk very briefly about NEPA and touch on some um, key points. So you may have heard of NEPA. It stands for the National Environmental Policy Act. Um, it was, it's been around since 1969, so it is certainly not new. Um, NEPA requires federal agencies to consider the environmental impacts of any projects that they either fund, license, permit, or otherwise approve. So in FRA's case, um, the provision of grant funding is a NEPA trigger. And when we conduct a NEPA review, we're actually looking at not just that one law of NEPA, but several laws under what we call a NEPA umbrella, and they're listed there on that slide. I, I won't read them off, but again, so we, we look at a variety of laws um, regarding the protection of the uh, human and natural environment. And on this slide, we just got some key terminology. Um, the NEPA process at FRA is documented in one of three ways, starting with a categorical exclusion, and then going to an environmental assessment and then up to an environmental impact statement. The CE is typically um, for your more routine maintenance projects with very little potential for environmental concerns, all the way up to an environmental impact statement, which we would do if, for example, um, maybe not under this program, but if we were to be funding a brand new construction of a new rail line, that would likely trigger an EIS. So for this program, we typically are in the uh, territory of doing a CE or an environmental assessment. And the key is to start the NEPA process early. Um, even if you think you have a pretty routine project such as bridge repair or replacement, you know, you may be getting into in-water work that um, may impact wetlands or protected species or habitat and require some permitting or some consultation with the Fish and Wildlife Service or some state agencies. So again, um, begin NEPA very early and NEPA must be completed and approved before we can obligate the grant. As Brian explained, um, I believe with this year of the partnership program, um, we can fund preliminary engineering and environmental review uh, or final design and construction or some combination. So if you are coming into the program applying for a grant for final design and construction, you're going to be in one of two scenarios. Either you're going to have NEPA already done. And in that case, you would just provide us a copy of your completed NEPA document, um, including the type of the document, the year it was approved, and who the lead federal agency was. It could be FRA, if you would come in and done work with us on a prior grant for PE and NEPA, or it could be another agency within or outside of DOT. Um, if the NEPA document that was completed previously is several years old, we will have to take a look at it to consider the passage of time and whether the findings are still valid. 
Um, if you come to us and you don't have NEPA done, but you're applying for uh, final design and construction, you will have to do NEPA basically on your own, at your own expense. Um, certainly in coordination with us, but if you don't specify that you're applying for NEPA funding, um, then you would be responsible for those costs. And that could also include um, having to hire a consultant if you're getting into projects that may have effects to um, environmentally sensitive areas and resources, such as, again, water, uh, water bodies, wetlands, uh, habitat, parks and recreational resources, historic properties, um, if you've got sensitive receptors such as schools or hospitals next to your project area, et cetera. And then another scenario, you may be coming in um, actually applying for a grant to pay for NEPA, in which case um, we would obviously have to obligate the grant and then you'd work with us to develop a NEPA document and we would determine what the appropriate level is, whether it's a CE, an EA, or an EAS, based on your project uh, scope of work and the environmental setting. But again, you also may want to hire a qualified environmental consultant for the preparation of that NEPA document, depending on the type of project and the resources that may be impacted by that project. In addition to NEPA, you should make sure you're um, taking into consideration timing to get permits from perhaps the Coast Guard or the Army Corps of Engineers and the time it may take to consult with um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or your state historic preservation officer. And also, if you're having to acquire property or get permission to access uh, property to conduct surveys or for easements, uh, definitely factor in the amount of time it may take to get those agreements in place. And as I said, we do have a bunch of webinars we've already delivered, so those are recorded and posted on our website. We also have our CE worksheet template and a guide to how you fill that out on our website. Um, we have an email address at the top here you can email that comes to me and several other folks, so um, you can use that anytime. I do encourage you, though, if you are someone that is new to NEPA or you're going to be responsible for doing NEPA for your grant, that you um, either look at our existing webinars or sign up for a future offering. And that is it from me, I think. Okay. Laura, I'm, uh, this is Brian again. I will re briefly do a couple recaps and reminders, and then we'll get to the questions. So I know we have a number and we'd like to get to those. Um, so of course, read the NOFO carefully. Think about what a successful project could look like. Make sure you submit all the documents. And I do emphasize when you're, when you're preparing these, you know, emphasize being clear and direct about responding to the criteria make your application easy to read and evaluate you know we, we will be evaluating a lot of these if your application one way you can stand out is by being very straightforward and clear about what you're proposing to do how much it'll cost what the outcomes would be um, i always suggest a last check to verify your funding and budget amounts uh, align especially that the amount of money that you say you are going to request from the program matches throughout your application so that we don't have to guess how much you are asking for. Um, so please check those funding numbers. And um, we'll close with this too, just so you have a bit of looking ahead. If you were selected for award, just a sense that we often then enter a pre application phase for six to 15 months. Um, and uh, then in a post obligation phase, this is when you actually have the money you're carrying out the project. That often runs two to five years, of course, depending on the scale and scope of the project. And you can see the types of activities that would be ongoing there during that time. And once your project is complete, we have a short closeout phase to wrap it all up, pay the final invoices, and, and issue a final performance report um, summarizing what the project accomplished. And with that, I've reached the end. Otherwise, of course, I do encourage you to reach out, especially to me, if you have any general questions about the program, um, or to Matt, Judah, and Laura for, for their uh, specialties. Um, and again, I thank you all for your time and joining the presentation today. We'd like to thank you all so much for joining us today for the Fiscal Year 2021 Federal State Partnership for State of Good Repair Grant Program Webinar. Today's webinar will be available on FRA's website in the next week. The webinar will end in about 20 seconds, so please copy or screenshot the contact information on the screen.